And welcome to the Daily Space Weather. We've got three new sunspots rising over the eastern limb of very high likelihood of large solar flares in various spots, both in the eastern limb and the western limb as a huge sunspot sets in the northwest. Let's take a look at what's going on in the northeast. There's the whole eastern limb. Again, three new sunspot groups rising there and the one just to the left of our Earth scale is looking like it is capable of producing large flares as well. It's quite active. There's a bunch of crackling of solar flare activity happening right in there. So there are those three new groups. These are 24-hour videos from SDO showing ionized iron at 171 angstroms and ionized helium in 304 angstroms. Again, there still is a very high likelihood of large solar flares, including X-class flares from this group setting on the western limb. And by the way, thanks for tuning into the Smash News Network Least Busted Name and News. Congratulations on realizing the channel exists. And if you enjoy the world's most comprehensive and detailed daily space weather and solar imagery, Make sure you do yourself a favor and press the subscribe button. You won't find more detailed imagery of the sun and indeed sometimes even of the earth any place in the world. Thanks to our new subscribers. And let's take a look at what's going on in the sun here in terms of sunspots and magnetic fields. This is SDO continuum for yesterday plus today, September 8th plus September 9th to date. And the magnetogram will show you those new sunspots. You'll be able to see those just popping up here over the eastern limb. Again, three of them. And the most active one looks like it is this one, the one that is closest to the equator. Let's see what's going on on Earth. By the way, there's been a massive earthquake uptick and a volcanic downtick. So here's what's going on with volcanoes. Sakurajima has exploded, produced a 7,000-foot plume of volcanic ash. Fuego in Guatemala has dispersed its ash. Occasional emissions from Nevado del Ruiz in Colombia. Sange has dispersed its ash, and Sabankaya here leading the way with a 24,000-foot plume of volcanic ash as it explodes at a flight level 240 over Peru. By the way, that's a reminder. Don't pull vault the caldera. If you're going on a volcanic vacation, leave your vault pole at home. Today's featured product is the Do Not Pull Vault the Caldera public service message brought to you at massive personal risk and expense by Smash Staff and I. If you'd like to support the channel via some merch, there's a great choice. We do have leggings, by the way, with the Do Not Pull Vault the Caldera public service message on it. If you're going through hell, keep going and don't become part of the lithosphere by ending up inside of a volcanic caldera. By the way, also you can sell, you can sell, <laughs> you can save 40% site wide on the Red Bubble Shop with the promo code. You deserve it. So make sure you enter that promo code if you are picking up some merch. And in the meantime, do not pull vault the caldera. Check it out. Here is the situation with earthquakes. And there have been some major ones, including a five in California. We'll get to it. Largest quake of the past 24 was a 6.8 close to Marrakesh, and that one likely caused untold amounts of damage, as many, many, many very ancient buildings are in that area of Morocco. So that 6.8 occurred at 22.11 universal time yesterday evening, and let's go on the world map here and cite quakes over a 5 plus magnitude, and there have been a lot. It's a global seismic uptick big time, and keep in mind, folks, any earthquake can be a foreshock. So major seismic unrest happening here. 5.2 struck the Mariana Islands region. That was at 1054 Universal Time yesterday morning. That was at depth of nearly 150 kilometers. Next on the list here, citing all quakes of a 5 or greater magnitude, a 5.6 hit Mexico there, the southwestern coast of Mexico. That was at 1553 Universal Time. Here's a 5.2 at Tonga. That was at depth as well, 220, 220 kilometers depth for that one. Another quake at Mexico there. So looks like a foreshock, and then perhaps that was the main quake there, a 5.6, and then a 5.8 at 1637 Universal Time. Then a 5.0 strikes Bernie, California. Check that out. There is the location of that one. Just north of the Cascade Range near... Lake Britain. 
the largest quake in California in quite some time. That was at 1724 Universal Time yesterday evening. A 5.1 hits Japan at 1728 Universal Time. Only four minutes later, across the Pacific Ocean, Japan seeing a 5.1 and then a 5.2. Only a half an hour later. About 40 minutes later. Then the Southern Atlantic Ridge has a 5.0. That was at 2032 Universal Time. And then that 6.8 strikes Morocco at 2211 Universal Time. Then Indonesia has a 5.6 at zero dark 06 this morning. That was at extreme depth, over 500 kilometers estimated depth. And then only about 39 minutes later, a 5.0 strikes Vanuatu. That was at depth also 163 kilometers at zero dark 45 this morning. So an insane number of quakes here. 5.3 at the Central Pacific Ridge this morning at 3.09 universal time. That is quite a list of five and greater magnitude quakes. And that's where it ends. So let's head back to space and see what's going on. In 171 angstroms, the house favorite wavelength from SDO. Let's look a little closer. Here's the equatorial zoom. And let's talk some additional space weather stats. The 10.7 centimeter radio flux still at 161 solar flux units. So that has flattened out since yesterday. 161 is the new radio flux number. We will see a big increase in the sunspot number coming today with those new with those three new sunspot groups. So in the next 24 to 36 hours, expecting a large increase in that red line there. That's the sunspot number. The black line is a 10.7 centimeter radio flux. That graph represents one year of solar activity. And we're still about one year out from solar maximum. Now we did have some CMEs. They do not appear to be earthly directed, so no need to show the NOAA Enlil spiral here. We'll show you some interesting looking halo CME eruptions. Those CMEs were not earthly directed. So NOAA's not forecasting any geomagnetic unrest or geomagnetic storms. We may see a minor CME impact on the 11th, but I don't think so. So best case scenario there, we will see a CME impact. But I don't think it's going, if, it, if we do see a CME impact, it's a stealthy CME and it's going to be pretty minor. Sometime after midday on the 11th, we may see a little uptick there. Noah not forecasting anything, and neither is NASA. So there's NASA's end little spiral, and indeed they are modeling that CME from yesterday on the opposite side of the sun. So there is a significant halo eruption, which we will show you later in the video here. The stealthy one that we're talking about is not ixnade by this. That, that is still a possibility. But the major CME there does appear to be on the opposite side of the sun. Next, Earth's magnetic moment from space. So here is the geospace magnetosphere movie. It depicts the past four hours of magnetohydrodynamic pressure to about 12 Earth diameters. That's the size of the main portion of Earth's magnetic field and most of the pressure there on the magnetotail side, the dark side of the planet. Next, ground magnetic perturbations map. It depicts magnetic flux density at the ground level, hence ground magnetic perturbations. It's showing changes to Earth's B field the field that goes through the magnet, this magnet being Earth, geomagnetically calm conditions. Now, we did see a KP3 early this morning, and I'm going to tell you why here in a minute. Current condition is KP1. Planetary K index is a global average of geomagnetism, and here comes the reason why we saw a KP3. The reason we saw a KP3 was because of this right here, a prime example of how a negative BZ, that is the vertical component of the magnetic field, induces current into the earthly system. So check it out. No change in the phi angle. No change in the density. No change in the solar wind speed. No change in the plasma temperature. It was just this that caused that geomagnetic spike. So a prime example there of how magnetic field orientation completely matters 
in terms of the solar wind inducing geomagnetism on planet Earth. Next, our GOES magnetometers here. We did have some, have some maneuvering there by the GOES-16. That's the arc jet moment. The thrusters create plasma. The plasma can affect the magnetometers. And those are pretty smooth over the past three days. Next, the top view ecliptic plane field plot. Earth is right in the middle of a south pole current sheet. No changes likely coming anytime soon for that. Just keep in mind the magnetic environment can suddenly change. Let's take a look at the line of sight field plot next. Here the sun's B field, the field that goes through the magnet. This magnet being the sun is depicted in blue. We've also got north and south polar field lines shown in green and red respectively. The gong magnetogram shown in grayscale. And let's move to coronal holes next. We do have some well-defined coronal holes and we can expect to see a solar wind uptick here in about three to four days from those south pole oriented coronal hole systems. We do have some trans equatorial coronal hole there of south pole orientation. Here are coronal holes from our favorite wavelength to view them from SDO 211 angstroms, one of the many species of ionized iron in the sun's atmosphere. So pretty well-defined coronal holes there. And those are associated with high-speed solar winds. And by the way, you can expect coronal holes to uptick over the next about two years. Again, we're still like a year out from solar maximum. Next, we'll move on to sunspots. I guess those are kind of an important feature of a solar cycle, right? So let's take a look at those and check out the flare monitor. It is... It's going berserk. Watch this. Flare probability 55%, 59%, And again, we've got multiple regions that are likely to produce a large solar flare. So we've got this group over here remains my most, it remains my favorite place for a large solar flare, the northwestern limb. This has been the most active region, so that's also likely to produce a major flare. And these groups over here, since they are close to the limb as well, they may produce major flares. We don't have a great view of what have, how magnetically complex those sunspots are yet. Let's take a look at SDO. Here's the past 24 hours showing 171 angstroms to feature those active regions. And of course, the SDO continuum. Another 24 hour video. Here's SDO continuum by itself. We've subtracted 171 angstroms here. Yowzers, that is a lot of umbrae. And it looks like this group might be growing a little bit here as it consolidates and approaches the limb. Another indication that it's going to produce a large flare, including the possibility of an X-Class event. Exciting stuff going on up there. Next, we'll go to energetic particles and flares. We haven't had any SEPs, solar energetic particle events. And so the GOES proton flux remains flatlined. It's at a baseline level, no spikes. The X-ray flux has increased back to a C-class background level. So we've got about a C1.3 background level here over the past about 24 hours. And no events of M-class or greater. The likelihood of those remains very, very high. Here comes one of our flare wavelengths. 94 angstroms is great at viewing flares. Again, very high likelihood of large flares both on the eastern limb and especially the northwest. The largest flare producer has been that region to the west of our Earth scale there. Here it is in 131 angstroms, another 24-hour SDO video for your viewing pleasure. All right, how you like them apples? Pretty sweet, right? Next, let's take a look up as I want to know what's going on overhead. What about you? So here's what's going on overhead over over my head right now. We're located in Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. 
this star chart is from skyandtelescope.org, and we've got the third brightest object and the second brightest object up there. And also sometimes the fourth brightest object. And the brightest intrinsic object also visible over there, that's Deneb, the tail of the swan in the constellation Cygnus. So Jupiter up there on the ecliptic, also the moon, and Venus and Mercury here heralding the rise of the sun. Just popping up to the horizon there. And here's the NASA APOD astronomy photo of the day. So this is the tail of comet Nishimura, which is going to be closest to the sun on September 17th. And in just a couple days, it'll be closest to the Earth. It has grown as it approaches the sun, an indication that it is disintegrating a bit. And there is some possibility that this comet will increase the intensity of a meteor shower coming in December. Great view of the tail there, and now we're getting into the tails as different chemicals react differently with the solar wind. Comet Nishimura is a great view of the coma, the nucleus of the comet. That's the astronomy photo of the day, courtesy of Peter Kennett. And that meteor shower that might increase would be the, sig the, sigma the Sigma Hydrids. So this comet could beef those meteors up. That's a pretty sweet situation, right? apod.nasa.gov if you want to view that yourself. And let's do a solar system forecast. So I guess the solar system is part of space weather, so let's advance this one week to show you the forecast. This is where things are today on 9-9-2023. Here's where things will be on the 16th. And let's talk coronal mass ejections. So here are yesterday's images, and you're going to see that halo eruption. That is a far side, not an Earth side coronal mass ejection. So it might look like an Earth-directed CME. It's not. One that's exactly opposite of Earthly directed also often appears as a halo. That one happening around midday yesterday. That's 90 frames from yesterday. Here are an additional 24 frames from today. And uh, it's been calm. The likelihood of CME is very high. Here's Soho Lasco C2 and C3. And you can see those that halo eruption there. A halo CME, the kind that looks like it's earthly directed. Let that play through one more time there. There it goes. Let's just rock that back. There's that halo on the C2, traveling the opposite direction of the Earth as it diffuses out through the solar system. And here it is on C3. So great example there of how deceptive things can be. And by the way, what's great about Stereo A here is we're going to start getting some better angular views of coronal mass ejections. That'll make it a little bit easier for us to forecast the trajectory of these events. So that's a good thing. Stereo A here moving out to the west of the Earth, represented on this imagery by the red circle. So there you go, Stereo A there finally moving a little bit farther out to the west. Here's the imagery from Stereo A. It's, it is a little bit spotty. We won't spend a lot of time talking about that, but we will show some custom videos Here are our custom coronagraphs. These are 24-hour videos, by the way. I'll zoom in a little bit closer. And if that wasn't earthly directed CME, we'd see some kind of plasma motion, most likely somewhere on the solar disk, but we're not really seeing that. Another indication that it is on the far side. There's just 193 angstroms by itself. 
And let's move to filaments. So here's the El Tide Spain ground-based solar observatory. By the way, we named this filament after my friend Eugene, Eugene the philosopher. Make sure you subscribe to his channel, by the way. If you want to name filaments, we'll talk about that in a minute. There's the El Tide Spain grayscale showing prominences. And we do have some prominences rising here over the eastern limb. No surprise there, as sunspots have just popped up as well. So this is one of the largest and densest filaments we've ever shown on the channel. And again, make sure you subscribe to Eugene the Philosopher. Make sure you follow us on Twitter if you are on social media. If you've unplugged entirely, we aren't surprised, and we don't blame you because it is pathetic with the state of censorship at the moment. There's Eugene the Philosopher's channel. Again, make sure you subscribe over there, his latest video. Professions that don't exist, like content creator and influencer. I, I don't know why he doesn't think that's a profession, but many people tend to disagree with you there, <laughs> Eugene. And here is the past about, that's about two and a half hours there from the GOES-16 SUVI. And you can see some flaring happening right around the equatorial region there on the eastern limb, that new sunspot. Looking like it might be quite magnetically complex as we see those flaring events happening there. And that brings us to bonus features. First satellite charging hazards, and we ain't got none. It's clear sailing for satellites. No electrons building up. No low energy electrons building up on the outside and no high energy electrons building up on the internal circuitry of those satellites. Goes electron flux here, seeing a little lower levels. I believe that's right about what NOAA forecasted. That's a three day chart using the radiographic measurements by GOES 16 and GOES 18. Here is the one year and a little dip there, just a moderate range of electrons for our relativistic electrons measured at the F layer of the ionosphere. And there is the, so the next, the next update here for the observation will be actually a little bit lower than the forecast, it looks like. That's NOAA's forecast for those relativistic electrons. Once again, those are measured at the F layer of the ionosphere. Let's take a look at the vibrational frequency of that layer, the bridge between Earth and space. So as you're seeing in this imagery, the F layer grows on the daytime side of the planet, and it shrinks on the nighttime side of the planet. This is showing megahertz, that's millions of vibrations per second. And the ionosphere is looking pretty normal. Here's the anomaly gram showing anomaly in megahertz from a 30 day median. Fairly unremarkable here over the past day. So sorry, this is not heralding the apocalypse. If you were hoping for the end of civilization, uh, this is not evidence of it. There it is, 1015 universal time and 1030 universal time for the anomaly gram. Ionogram, anomaly gram. Total electron content depicts the free electrons to about 12,500 miles of altitude. This is going to show you the most likely places for GPS errors as your GPS when it's communicating with your handset, if it communicates through a lot of free electrons, there is signal refraction. Try turning on Wi-Fi location accuracy. If your GPS is likely to produce major errors, they are most likely to happen around the equator at noontime. And this is also not an indication that it is now Armageddon. If there was a major geomagnetic excursion happening, those would be all over the place. Last but not least, we're going to show the anomaly from the 10-day average of total electron content, literally a count of electrons from ground level up to your GPS satellite. So there it is over North America, seeing significant high electron count anomalies here over the over large portions of North America. I'll just let it play through one more time. It speaks for itself. Some electron content anomalies there continuing over the Cascadia fault zone, places like Vancouver. Last but not least, we're going to show in our space weather segment 
Here is the latest intensity gram and latest magnetogram. Let's view these sunspots. That one's pretty small. It looks like it might only be alpha class. That one's pretty small. And that one there is looking a little bit larger. This group over here is quite magnetically complex. It is beta gamma delta class. This group up here, beta gamma delta class. This group over here, also beta gamma delta class. Likelihood of large solar flares remains extremely high. And it's time, time to talk meteorology because I see some indications that this hurricane is going to weaken. So let's show you why here. And once again, sorry about that, folks. We can't, we can't uh, forecast the apocalypse here as a result of this. So this hurricane is moving into very warm water. This is sea surface temperature, and this water up here is like 86 degrees. So that is quite warm water indeed. However, there are some problems. So first of all, this hurricane is making it, making it pretty likely that it's going to move actually to the north where the water is going to be quite a bit cooler. Now, our forecast isn't going to necessarily show that, but there is also some wind shear happening out there. So as it moves into this hot water, it does have some convective capability. However, there is also some dry air there that's not going to help it out. So this thing might not get as crazy as it looks. And let's just show sea surface temperature anomalies here. There's actually some anomalously cold water over here. So that will help it to weaken. And we'll just show all the sea surface temperature anomalies now that we've opened that can of worms. The North Atlantic is full of hot water, but there is some cold water over here, which could help to protect the US, weaken the system. And there's also wind shear, which we're gonna show you here when we show the maps of the local weather. So anyway, there are sea surface temperature anomalies for the Atlantic. Southern Hemisphere there featuring some anomalously cold water. Northern Hemisphere featuring some anomalously warm water. Not an indication that the NAO is shutting down. <laughs> you think you're going to see a year without a summer next year in Europe? Think again. It's just, it's just ridiculous. And here's the Pacific. That's sea surface temperature anomaly for the world's largest body of water and largest surface heat sink. A lot of hot water there on the equator and in the northern Pacific and some bands of cold water as well. Sea surface temperature anomaly for the Indian Ocean depicted here, pretty average. Southern Ocean depicted here, it's a mix of anomalously warm and anomalously cold. And here is the Arctic Ocean. And let's move on to some forecasts here from windy.com. So now we're looking at wind speeds. We're going to advance this three days. So there's where things will be at Tuesday at 12 noon. That would be 16, 1600 universal time. So it's going to be north of Puerto Rico. That is the Euro forecast. And check out the GFS forecast. GFS forecast features it quite a bit farther to the northwest of where the Euro forecast puts that system. I tend to agree with the Euro forecast on this one, and we're going to show you why here in just a minute. So there's the GFS forecast for Tuesday, September 12th at 12 noon Eastern time, or 1600 uh, Universal time, or Zulu time. There's the GFS model for Tuesday at 12, and there is the Euro model for Tuesday at 12, much farther southeast on the Euro model. So here is the clouds and fog view for the Americas. And we're zoomed out farther than where we usually show it because we're going to show you that hurricane up close. So check it out. There it is. And I'm going to show you some resistance that it's facing here. So that's the shortwave radiation map. It shows clouds and fog when it's too dark for the visible satellite. And here's the water vapor map. And out ahead of that, there is a bunch of dry, massive air. So that's not going to help very much. Uh, so it's weakened a little bit there, and there's going to be some wind shear associated with that dry, massive air. So it's got a little bit of a, it's got a little bit of resistance there. 
You can see that dry mass of air there in the orange. If it had moist air ahead of it, that would really help it to accelerate and to increase its convective powers. Anyway, here's our US weather.gov map showing weather warnings. We've got some flood watches here around North Carolina, Virginia, and West Virginia. And let's show some forecasts. So here's a smoke forecast. We are seeing some Canadian smoke here making its way through North Dakota and Minnesota. Also some pretty significant fires in Northern California and Oregon. Some smoke making it all the way down into places like Arkansas and Alabama. So that's a smoke forecast. It's firesmoke.ca, by the way, if you want to monitor that yourself, firesmoke.ca. And here's a pressure and precipitation forecast for the lower 48. So some heavy rains there coming to parts of the eastern U.S. Let's check rainfall totals. This is total accumulated precipitation based on the same GFS 72 hour model. And a lot of rain falling in the ocean there, like two feet of it. That is way better than falling on land. Heavy rains here forecasted in the coming three days on the east coast of the U.S. All the way from Maine down to South Carolina. Some very high rain totals there, including four inches or more in parts of Maine. Last but not least, it's a 72-hour GFS model for pressure and wind. So it looks like the GFS model agrees with me as it's not showing as low a pressure for that Atlantic hurricane as it did in yesterday's model. Again, that's a 72-hour GFS pressure and wind speed model. There are some indications that system is going to turn to the north. We won't worry about it at the moment. We show three-day forecasts because those tend to be accurate. Next, our lightning mapper. And yowzers, did we have some crazy lightning in Pennsylvania last night? Around like 9, 10 o'clock? We thought it might be the apocalypse, but it was just really bizarre-sounding lightning. Quite a bit of lightning here around the Americas at the moment. Quite a bit indeed. Check out the lightningmaps.org site. Quite a lot of strikes around Central America, the East Coast. Well, you see the map. There you go. Next time you hear thunder, check it out. Lightningmaps.org, real-time lightning maps. Very useful for those going out and doing things. By the way, if you enjoy the content, please visit our links like smashamash.com. We would prefer these videos to continue to exist, remain publicly visible and free for all to view, so help out the channel. Visit smashomash.com and welcome to the Neo Renaissance. Hit us up on social media. You can find the Red Bubble Shop and tell your friends and foes not to pull vault the caldera. Also, links to the Hemp Lucid Shop, the Spotify Music Channel, Instagram, and lots more. Smashomash.com. One of our affiliate slash sponsors is Hemp Lucid. So if you're picking up CBDs or perhaps mushroom gummies, etc., why not shop through our shop? Help support the channel that way with some tangibles. I'm an endorser of the Focus and Stress Mushroom Gummies. There are also Sleep Mushroom Gummies. Check out the CBD Body Balms and Lip Balms. They make great gifts, even CBD for your pets from the Hemp Lucid shop. Today's featured product is what I'm wearing. The Pink Flamingo shirt. You can find it on the Amazon shop. It's at Amazon.com slash shop slash smash oh mash. I'm a collector. And you can find those Hawaiian shirts in the Spacewear collection. This one is the Pink Flamingo shirt. And if you want to support the channel via subscription services and get additional content, get email alerts and so on, then Become a member of the Smash Team at smashomash.com slash smash team. We launched our subscription services site back in October of 2021 officially. There's a bronze. There's a silver. There's a gold level. It's kind of like Patreon, just better. It's our own website. It's got superior capabilities. Smashomash.com slash smash team to support the channel and get additional content. 
thanks to the Smash Team. These videos are brought to you in part by the Smash Team and mainly at massive personal risk and expense by Smash staff and I. Did you know that our annual operating loss is like $70,000? Yeah, help offset it by subscribing to the Smash Team. The best value is the gold annual paid up subscription. We're going to close out with U.S. Doppler radar, clouds and fog, and water vapor for the lower 48. So there's the U.S. full 50 state view. Some heavy precipitation there striking the west coast of Canada and Alaska. Here's a lower 48 view, which we will fixate on for the remainder of this video. Here is clouds and fog over that same region. And let's don't forget water vapor. Again, you see all this dry air down here. This is not going to help that system, but it's not going to be a major hindrance either. Again, there is a bunch of warm water up there, and the cold water doesn't start until you're around this area in here. So if it does get closer and closer to the U.S., it's going to weaken because of the cold water. In the meantime, it might weaken just because of that dry mass of air, as it does have some, some hurdles to overcome in order to really strengthen. So it's looking like it's weakening just a little bit, Here's the recap, U.S. Doppler radar, clouds and fog, 3.9 micrometer infrared radiation, and 6.19 micrometer infrared radiation, the water vapor map. And we hope you're not consuming water vapor crap on YouTube. Again, do yourself a favor and press the subscribe button if you're new to the channel. Thanks to our new subscribers. And press that like button, regardless of how long you've been watching the content. Anyway, I'm out. I've been your host, Dan, a.k.a. Smash O'Mash, signing off, and may that solar wind be at your back.